Okay, we're live once more. Sorry about that. I um, uh, think he pushed the wrong button or something. All right, but we'll get him back in just a second, and we'll get this show um, on the way. Uh, so while we do that, let me tell you, I'm quite excited. On Wednesday, we're going to have um, the JKD uh, I Love Jeet Kune Do broadcast at, uh, at 3 o'clock, and then at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, we'll have... Uh, uh, episode number two of the FMA files with um, Sifu Guru Gai Che, so we'll be good. Okay. How do we sound now? Much better. Okay. All right. I was living like 10 seconds in the past. So every time you were saying something, I could hear the previous conversation going on, and it was it was doom double place. Okay. But we're so, good to go. All right. So what did you do to fix that? Because you seem to be quite the tech guy. Um, I wouldn't say I'm that techy, but I know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should tell everybody that you, so you've started your own podcast. Yes, right? I have. Actually, okay. largely, largely inspired by yourself, if you don't mind me saying so. Oh, I don't mind that at all. <laughs> I, like, I like to know what effect I'm having out there in the world. It, it's a tremendously positive one, let me assure you of that. So... Let me just move this a second. There you okay. go, sir. A better view of my beauteous visage. Yeah, um, there you go. So what it actually was is the way you do the podcasting with the, the Facebook and the cameras and all that sort of thing was like, oh, that's cool. That's actually mm -hmm. low tech but highly effective. Right. So all these other guys who've got bloody things falling all over the place. Look at that. Ah, there we go. So I thought, well, if Dwight can do it, why don't I give it a cry? Mm -hmm. So I did. And yeah. there you go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> was... Yeah. And, uh, and I, I appreciate your telling me about uh, the, the, is it Anchor? Anchor the, FM. The, right. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm, I'm looking into that. Um, well, what, we... what, what I'll do is when we finish this, mm -hmm. I'll touch base with you again via messenger and I'll show you how to do that. It's, it's easy to do. And you end up with a full audio uplink podcast like that. It's okay. so easy. Cool. I appreciate that, man. All right. So. We got to we got to do this. Um, your name's Jay Cooper, and you were telling us that's your maiden name. No, that's my main name. My actual your full main name. <laughs> my main name. I I pretty much answer to anything, in fairness. Um, but Jay Cooper is what everybody knows me as on my day to day basis. So it's more my students, my friends, and everybody calls me. Mm -hmm. But my nom de guerre um, is the Hound. Right. So de Hunder is old norse for the hound which is why i use that okay all right so that's why you use it but that's not all there is to that come on no it's not i, I you got, gotta go you gotta go deeper so i got the name um have you are you familiar with the tv show game of thrones many people are many people aren't it depends on which side I'm of the coin you fall i'm one of those who is not okay well there's a character in game of thrones called the hound and there's one particular scene in it where he's with a girl called Arya, who's been doing this so-called water dancing, because she's doing all this acrobatic sword fighting. And he, he's like, who taught you that shite? And she's like, this, what do you know about it? And at the end of it, he says, well, come on, show me what you know. And um, she tries to do something. And he basically just slaps her across the face. And it, it's an amusing scene contained within the series. Okay. I, I posted it as one of my favorite scenes and my business partner and top student Sarah Jade said, you do realize this is exactly what a private lesson with you is like, don't you? <laughs> and so okay. si then Singh, my teacher, was like, oh my God, he's totally the hound. So ah. that was, and I also cursed a blue streak. So okay. I, as it. he's as he's quite salty in his language as well, it seems to be an appropriate mix for the names and the nicknames of things. So. Yeah. Okay. So you know what I did uh, TV wise to prepare for talking to you? Okay. I, I watched, uh, I'm watching uh, Turn, Washington Spies. Do you know that show? <laughs> I've heard of it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what, um, that's what, so, so for those who, for th those who don't know, we can actually say shite and get away with it. Yes, we definitely right. do. <laughs> okay, so now, so here's the other thing. Um, Jay Cooper sounds like an American cowboy actor's name. Mm -hmm. You have a British accent. Yes. 
Your Facebook name is Norse. Yes. <laughs> you live in Canada. Yes. So is this why the JKD blend is perfect for you? I suspect there's a lot of that to it. I'm nothing <laughs> if I'm nothing if not culturally inconsistent. Yeah. So yeah. How did you end yeah, so okay, so give us the background of that then. Where does the accent comes from where and why are you in Canada? The accent come from Manchester in the United Kingdom. So okay. I was bo born and bred there. Um, the town I was born, um, it's actually a little place called Hyde, which up until a few years ago, nobody really knew where it was. Mm -hmm. Then there was a doctor in England called Dr. Harold Shipman, who murdered uh, about 30 of his patients. And he had his surgery based in Hyde. So if anybody knows anything about serial killers, they kind of know where Hyde is now. So it's a dubious ah. place. It's a dubious yeah. claim to fame, but it's a claim to fame nonetheless. Yeah. So that was where I was born and bred. I went down um, briefly, did a little bit of time in Yorkshire at university. Then I went to the south of England where I joined the police force. Um, that was where I met my, uh, my wife. And during that time, we, as I was in the police, she left to go back to further education. And during that time, I actually ended up in the States for 12 months. Um, I actually trained with uh, Jack McVicker uh, for 12 months while I was out in the States. And then having done the year there, because she got over there as part of her university exchange program, mm -hmm. returned from that, and that kind of gave us the bug for emigrating. Now, believe it or not, I actually managed to get a job with Champaign-Urbana Police Department, okay. which, was, which was cool. And yeah. had 9-11 not happened within uh, two weeks of me getting the job. So, of course, the chances of getting in became instantly slimmer. Right. I had the state labor authorization. I had the local congressman backing me, but they said they didn't consider policing a skilled profession. Wow. Really? Make of that, make of that what you will. It wasn't okay. classified as a skilled profession. They said, we don't think there's anything particularly um, that you bring to the table that we couldn't train someone else to do. Okay, not a case mm -hmm. I'm going to win. But by that point, we decided we wanted to, to leave the United Kingdom and, and seek um, a, a life elsewhere. And okay. can Canada seemed the next logical choice. So we explored right. the options there. And as luck would have it, Alberta was doing what they called provincial nominee program because we had this big oil boom going on. Nobody wanted to do policing when you could earn $50 an hour serving burgers in McDonald's to all the oil workers. So there was this gap between the job and, and the, the people willing to do it. Right. So from that perspective, I simply applied as an experienced officer. Canada, unlike the United States, thinks policing is a skill. And uh, they hired me and I've been here ever since. But doesn't Canada have a thing where if a Canadian can do it, then they offer it to the Canadian first? Only if the job itself is either lacking in skills or lacking in applicants. And that's where the provincial nominee program came in. What they said is that the, the government gave them... Um, authorization to fulfill, to fill the roles from outside because what they said mm -hmm. is we can't we can't fill these jobs nobody wants to do policing um, we need people from outside to do it and they wanted people from outside with experience which they said would right. add to the, the diversification and the skill set of the Canadian officers. Okay, now I'm gonna play the role of obnoxious American. Okay. Um, you don't have any experience being police in England because you don't carry guns. Um, well, there is some truth to that, but we face them. And do so, what? Um, we say, put that gun down, or I'll tell you to put that gun down again. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> we talk to them in a stern tone of voice. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, what, what we actually have is, it's a bit of a, that one of the reasons that we don't have guns within the UK as officers is they're not commonly encountered on the streets. Right. Um, UK has much more of a knife culture than it does as a gun culture. So we're more mm -hmm. likely to encounter a knife. That's a separate issue within itself, of course, because if you give me the choice between facing a knife without a gun and with a gun, I'll choose the gun every time. Yes. Um, but we do have armed response officers. Right. So although we don't have guns and uh, our own knives, we have batons, we have CS spray over there, um, we have the ability to call in extra resources. Um, but you, although you don't have the hard skill, which is the gun, the soft skills, which is the communication, the talking down, that takes forefront because you don't have the ability to put 
you know, 180 grains into an individual with a knife. You have to find another mm -hmm. solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. Now, while I was over there, I did face knives a couple of times, came away unscathed and successfully dealing with them. But what it means is when you take that skill set you develop on the softer side of the fence, so you learn the articulation piece, you learn the de-escalation piece, the communication piece, um, you get into that person's mind, you try and talk them down, bring them down, and you minimize the threat as best you can. It means when you then are given a gun, such as when I came to Canada, it's not my first response, but it becomes a response. And this is one of the common criticisms that's leveled at police officers with firearms, and indeed firearms as, as, as a rule overall. Now, I'm a, before I go any further, I'm a huge Second Amendment advocate for you guys down there. Um, right. I'm, a fi I'm a firearms owner myself, so I actually I have my uh, possession and acquisition license in Canada, and I think there's a place for guns in, in society. Um, but if the only tool you have is a hammer, every single problem starts to look like a nail. And the problem is when you're given a gun, you're so, the way you deal with a knife is a gun. The way you deal with a weapon is a gun. The way you deal with a yes. group is a gun. The way you deal with a gun is a gun. And I'm not saying there isn't a time when the gun will be the solution to that problem. Right. But there is also a whole scale that you learn to read and recognize leading up to the deployment of that lethal force. And this has always been a big bugbear of mine, not just with guns, but within martial arts, within the self-industry as a whole. It's the scalability of response and it's the scalability of what you do to an individual in response to what they're doing to you. And it's not always gun to gun, knife to knife, fist to fist. There are a myriad of options open to you, some of which might just be talking to the individual and listening to what they've got going on. That talking to the individual thing reminds me of one of my favorite, and we've been talking about TV series. So this is one of my favorite TV series of all times, a Canadian production called Flashpoint. Mm -hmm. Do you know, you know the show? I know of it, certainly, yeah. Okay. Uh, because when I, I, I was the only person in my circle who had ever seen it. And my description of it to everybody was, it was SWAT, team members who are all psychologists. <laughs> right. Right? Because everybody, everybody is a sniper, but everybody can talk you down as well. So the, the concept is like kind of a hostage response team. So they fulfill the roles, whether that's um, barricading, sniping, or talking. So is that kind of the vibe that you got, that's got? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a great, okay. great show. Flashpoint. And of course, you know, um, it, it didn't do that well here and then um I, I i think um like one of the cable channels picked it up and produced it for a couple more seasons so you, you should definitely take um i'll, I'll take, let you take, take a, a look, look at, at that actually yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's it's it it was really good i i loved it um okay so now explain to me esteem martial arts and havoc jkd okay so yin yang let's look at yin yang Okay. Um, what happened was um, when Havoc came about, I was teaching um, at a, a school within my local city of Calgary, Alberta. Um, and I was a guest instructor at a school, not going to name the school, um, but we had professional differences with regards to our view of martial arts. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think it was something you could buy, nor did I think it was like, you know, you paid your fee, therefore you get your belt. To me, it was always about the, the integrity of the art. So, yeah. you know, and, we, and I'm not saying they're wrong and I'm right. I'm just saying I had my way doing things. They had their way doing things. And we just, we ultimately hit an impasse on a, on a yeah. philosophical sense. So I started teaching at my garage. Um, I set my garage, it matted it out, did the things on the wall, and I was teaching at my home base. So I called that Havoc JKD. One of my students from the old dojo had already separated on her own and she created Esteem Martial Arts. So she would literally finish teaching her classes, shove the kids and all the adults out the door, lock it, get in a car, burn it all the way up to then come out the car, jump on the mats in time for my warm up. So right. she was, that, and that was how dedicated she was both as a, as a student. It got to the point where I outgrew my garage very quickly because you got, you know, six people in the garage feels busy. Yeah, I was regularly getting 10 to 12 in there. And it was like, well, this is not only sweaty, someone's going to get clattered and clattered quite badly because we're running out of space. So I mentioned in passing that I was going to have to seek alternative premises to her. And she said, well, how about you sublet off me or we just come together and we pay the, the bills together? Because mm -hmm. I, she said, I spend half my time here anyway. So yeah. why don't... And that was how it came together. So 
originally when we came together, people, we, it's like, should we take one name over the other? And I said, well, why would we? Because we represent this situation. We've got two brands coming together. Mm-hmm. Habit JKD is, you know, much more um, assertive. It's aggressive, for want of a better word. And it addresses the self-defense, self-protection, and all associated disciplines that go along with that, as well as Jeet Kune Do. Esteem martial arts is uh, a softer, more considered approach. It's more about the development of, the, you know, it's got the kids, it's got the family. So yeah. you, you're not going to get a five-year-old doing habit. Right. And you're not going to get a 25-year-old tattooed lump head doing esteem. <laughs> Right. So the idea yeah. was it's the yin yang and it's the balance. Got it. Funnily enough, depending on what we're doing, if we're doing a seminar for kids, Esteem does it. If we're doing a self-defense seminar, Havoc does it. So yeah. we can actively rotate and we can flip the brands according to what it is that we're doing. Right. So the easiest way I usually describe it is Esteem is the school, Havoc is the style. Okay. Now, um, explain the acronym for everybody. Um, Havoc stands for Hostile, Aggressive, Violent Offender Combatives. And originally it was based around my time in policing. And it was a condensation to all the stuff I'd done training, teaching, and et cetera over the years. Now, the reason I called it Havoc originally was although I was teaching Jeet Kune Do, and I was practicing Jeet Kune Do, and I'd been doing it for a number of years, I didn't hold a grade in it. To me, mm-hmm. it felt remiss to then say I was teaching Jeet Kune Do when I had no authorization to do so. Right. Um, again, I, skill is one thing. Um, authorization to transmit that skill is something else. Mm-hmm. And I, call me old-fashioned, but if I'm not authorized to teach something, I don't then claim I'm teaching something. No, you're so, not old-fashioned. You're British. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Um, okay. <laughs> so I call what I did Havoc because it seemed to suit several things. So it's, a, it's each piece is – it's. If you look at the response options you get as a police officer that necessitate the physical response, someone's going to be hostile towards you, uh, you know, screw you, cop. They're going to be aggressive towards you, yeah, yeah, it's squaring up. Or they're going to be violent towards you and actually attacking. And mm-hmm. I wanted a series of response options that would actually be able to address all of those points. Right. It also represents what a fight is. It's havoc. Uh, you know, if right. you're in a real fight and your life's on the line, you know, it's not, you know, jab we've and all this and it's no it's blood it's not it's teeth it's all sorts of stuff going on so yeah. it, enca- it encapsulated what a fight was and the paradigm of havoc itself the hostile aggressive violent offended combatives was a beautiful fit and not trying to be uh uh too uh, glib about it it's a pretty cool acronym <laughs> so, so do you know what i mean if, if, right it, if it had been like Mahurfi, like it's not quite the same, but Havoc, yeah. oh yeah, that's got some balls oh, yeah. to it, you know. I mean, well, that's why I wanted to talk to you because of the cool name. It is, you see. Yeah, you know. Then you um, found out it was British, and you're like, oh shit, right. <laughs> probably shouldn't have asked him on. Yeah, listen, um, but the actual start in JKD, because you just mentioned that you were training in it. So was that back in Manchester? Where was that? Um, it was actually my first Jeet Kune Do instructor was um, not including the time you spend on the videos. Because if we include video time, hell, everybody's a JKD practitioner, you know. <laughs> um, but the fir- my first real Jeet Kune Do instructor that I spent any time with was actually Guru Lee Banda, um, who's based out of Kent. So when I joined the police, okay. um, I took my, so I've done previous martial arts before Jeet Kune Do. I've done karate, yeah. I've done, done jiu-jitsu, I've done kickboxing, I've done a few other things. Yeah. So when I went um, to join the police in the south of England, uh, Guru Lee Banda was my very first Jeet Kune Do instructor formally. Now, I trained a little in Hull with Andy Norman, um, mm-hmm. who's of Defence Lab fame. Um, mm-hmm. And through him, I trained with like Husto uh, Dieguez, Dieguez yeah. Casey, and Mark yeah. McFan. Um, I did a, a, a session with Mark McFan as well, okay. um, who's one of the great unknown names in the jkd community in my opinion should actually be much much more widely known than he actually is yeah um but I agree. so I, so I, i'd had some exposure at that end when i moved but that was like seminars and and very casual acquaintances when i went to the south and i i lived in kent i worked uh, and trained under guru lee banda who was um um one the uh, richard bustillo and he was also a docu perez representative within the uk as well um okay. former, former world stick fighting champion so right. i started training i trained with lee then having trained with lee i went to america for a year and then i did 12 months with jack mcvicker in jeet kundo vunak line and brazilian jiu-jitsu because 
I mean, Jack's a phenomenal JKD practitioner. Anyone that's actually ever crossed hands with Jack, the dude can go. You know, mm-hmm. he can mm-hmm. he can really move. But his Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is frankly second to none. He's off the charts good with it. I mean, I think he's just took gold again for you know the twenty millionth year running, and he's he's wow. he, he, oh, he's phenomenal. Jack's another guy that more people should know. In my my view, um, both within the JKD world and the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu world, he's he's again okay. just just another level on that stuff. So I try I'll to add him. I'll add him to the list. He's a good one. He's a good yeah. one. Yeah. Um, so having trained with Jack, I then came back to the UK, uh, trained some more with Lee again. Then I went to the north of England, kind of maintained a JKD lineage. Um, there's a guy I trained with there called Steve Crutchley. Um, who, although he was better known as a sambo wrestler, actually he was with Steve Powell, who was a UK JKD fan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I tra- trained with him, kept my hand in there. And then, um, yeah, most of it was experimentation, drilling, finding out my own after that. And uh, right. I, I was in the wild when I came to Canada. And um, <laughs> shortly after coming here, that was when uh, uh, Paul Bunat launched the Descendants of the Masters program. Right. Um, when he first got that going. And uh, originally, I was supposed to go under Tom, uh, Tom Cruise. Right. Um, and for whatever reason, Tom couldn't handle my application or wouldn't, just whatever reason, I, I didn't end up with Tom. And he said, I'm going to refer you to, to our other uh, uh, guy who's in the game, Singh. Right. So I said, okay, fine. So I reached out to Singh and talk about a, a moment of mm-hmm. destiny that was meant to be. That was when we first connected. Yeah, I I um I don't know if everybody saw the picture of the two of you that I used because I you know I was I was I was trying to find all these pictures and I go that looks like the best one. <laughs> it's <Yeah. laughs> I, I love that. <laughs> Funnily enough, that picture was actually taken in a Chinese restaurant and uh, Bruce Lee's sister Phoebe Lee was there with us at the time as well. Ah, wow! Is so, in Can- in Canada or no? Th- this was in the U.S. It was actually okay. down down in California. Oh, okay. All right. So. So, okay, so now you've explained how people, how you came to Jeet Kune Do. In your mm-hmm. experience, right, in your experience, how do, like, regular people, because you're not regular, how do regular people come to Jeet Kune Do? Or why do they come to Jeet Kune Do? It's a good question. I find martial arts as a whole is crazy niche. Not everybody wants, everyone's aware of it, but not everybody wants to do it. Mm-hmm. Jeet Kune Do is a niche within a niche. It's, yeah, sub-niche. It, it's a sub-niche, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's two types of people I tend to find that you come to Jeet Kune Do. There are people that are generally interested in, in self-defense. They want something more than the so-called strip mall karate or the McDojo style thing. They mm-hmm. want something with a little more substance to it. Jeet Kune Do, because of the, um, uh, the marketing hype that often goes along with it, is seen as a self-defense art. So they kind of come in for that reason. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a third group I'll come on to in a minute. The second group are the ones that have an interest in the art itself because of Bruce Lee. Um, they want to get nuanced into it and they want to immerse themselves in that too. So I tend to find people have either got a legitimate interest in Bruce Lee and his art or they want self-defense. The third group is the fanboys. Now, is that a term of affection? No. Have you ever found any fangirls? Have you ever come across uh, fangirls? Not often, surprisingly. I, I, I guess in their out there, they just yeah. don't put themselves forward as much as the boys do. Um, mm-hmm. You know, because there's nothing that impresses me more than you telling me what you know about Bruce Lee and then I don't. And I, it, It's like, seriously, it's like, oh, you, you're going to fit in well here, son. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but no, the fanboys, the reason I, I put them as a third group and as a subgroup is they don't stay. They don't stay. Right. Be- because as, as soon as they find out that not only is it not like it is in the movies, right. but there's a very real chance of me breaking your nose, right. they lose interest instantly. When there's effort yeah. involved, when there's stress involved, or when there's anything involved that has a consequence to it, they lose it all interest altogether and they go back to, you know, you know whatever that is they do. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the most polite way I can put that. It's, yeah. yeah. I, I, um, back when you, you were talking about police in, in, uh, in the United Kingdom, mm-hmm. um, and you said it's more of a knife culture, does, is, is there then a, a lot of interest in Filipino martial arts in England because of that? No, Among I, police? Among no. police? No. no. Policing overall, it's, it, police are a very strange breed. 
Um, and I, I found this to be universal, both in the United States, in Canada, and in the UK. I got no reason to doubt it's any different anywhere else. Um, police hate to admit they don't know something or mm -hmm. can't do something. So if you offer free martial arts training to police or massively discounted martial arts training to police, none of them will take you up on it. They're just not interested in doing that. They're given the stuff at the academy. They're right. given their own training. In the, in the States and Canada, they're given a gun. In the UK, they're given a baton and a nice big, big blue tip on the head. Um, so they're considered that they're ready for action. They don't invest in their personal safety and personal well-being. It's almost like, well, I haven't been issued it, therefore I don't need it. Huh. Um, culturally, policing is very insular and it's very resistant to external influences and change. It's weird because it's even harder to make changes from within, believe it or not. Right. Because if you come in and you say, well, hey, how about we do it this way? If they then adopt it, what they're saying is we were doing it wrong before. Hmm. Doesn't that sound, a... doesn't that sound, a... go, go ahead, finish. No, go on, go on. Doesn't that sound a little bit like one of the Jeet Kune Do situations that we have? Uh, go ahead, explain. Well, the, I, the idea that, uh, well, if we, if we admit that there's another way of doing it, all right, then maybe we're admitting that we were doing it wrong before. Surely, Dwight, you're not implying that Jeet Kune Do is an art of self-discovery and perfection versus a dogmatic thing that we should adhere to as if it was gospel truth. Uh, no, not at all. I would never uh, do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely, you're, you're on the money. Uh, the, the thing is as well, now this is a controversial viewpoint, but it's one I've never been shy of putting forward anyway. To think that Bruce Lee at 32 years of old had reached the apex of perfection and wasn't going to go anywhere else, change anything else or do anything else is frankly ludicrous. It's one of the most asinine viewpoints put forward. When I look back, I mean, I'm 45 now. I look back on when I was 32, I barely knew my ass from a hole in the ground. So why I, I would think that Bruce, as gifted and as amazing and as talented as he was, at 32 had suddenly peaked and was like, right, that's it, lads, I'm finished. Right. N yeah. No. So it seems logical, given the way Bruce was developing himself, given the way things are moving forward, he would have continued to develop and refine going ahead. So... When you see a lot of people in JKD world these days, and I include myself within this, we do things that Bruce didn't necessarily do. That's a natural progression with the caveat that we apply those principles of directness, simplicity, relevance, and effectiveness to whatever mm -hmm. technique we introduce. Right. If, if we adhere to the principle that Bruce is applying to Jeet Kune Do, there's no harm to my mind in introducing something else, provided it fits and is a logical complement to the art. Yeah. Okay. Give me an example of that. Give me an example of something that you came across and you thought, okay, this is valuable, but not the way it was presented to me. So let me apply better JKD principle to it. Do you have such an example? Um, off the top of my head, one of the first things I can come up with is um, I'll use one that I did from policing. So mm -hmm. with, there's a technique called the lateral vascular neck restraint, um, which is effectively a bit closer to the camera. Let's see if I can give you some more range on that. For, if you Google it, it'll tell you what it is. But for one okay. of a better for one of a better description, it's a police version of a rear naked choke. Right. So let me just see if I can wedge the iPad there. So the idea behind the LVNR is you have the head here, and you make mm -hmm. this kind of like your arms are here. So it's like you put your head in the back of them, and it's stop resisting, stop resisting. I told you stop resisting. No, 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 no. Okay, you need to go out. So it's a series of responses. So Obviously, it's not in Jeet Kune Do because it's a relatively modern police innovation. But there are several things within it that I found problematic. This is one of them, this kind of seesaw effect. Yeah. In principle, and when you're actually writing it down and drilling this on the map, it kind of makes sense. When you've got a crackhead that's covered in his own piss and shit at 3 o'clock in the morning, this starts to get a little slippy and hard to maintain. So the first thing I did is I took the JKD filter, which is like the effectiveness, the simplicity, and the directness. And it's like, if mm -hmm. I got this hole... Because I need the head regardless. If I drop the anchor, I remove the necessity for putting my head because I've actually anchored them at the back here and I can still maintain the point. So I made yeah. a 90 degree lockdown versus a 180 lockdown. Because if I put my head here, I've got this teeter totter, but I'm going to get this whole body part here is going to cause me issues. If I lock right. the body, the head's kind of already there. So I just applied that principle. The other thing is as well, I don't know anybody that wants to put their head in close contact with 
you know, someone that's, you know, right, less hygienic. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was one such example. Now, that's not necessarily adding it to JKD, but it's adding a JKD filter to that particular technique. Yeah. Well, see, that, that's the thing, right? I don't know if we have enough discussions about how people have applied their JKD principles to other things. You mm -hmm. know, I think we're always caught up in, well, who's doing Jeet Kune Do the right way? The, you know, the original way or the pre-1973 way or the yeah. classical way or the concepts way or the blend way or the, the American Jeet Kune Do way or the, you know... I, <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it re I mean, get there's funny things as well. Like, you, there's almost sacrilege to question key elements within Jeet Kune Do, as if to say, well, mm -hmm. Bruce came up with it, so therefore you can't question it. Bruce was an amazing man, but he was a man. Nothing should be sacrosanct. And just because something worked for Bruce doesn't mean it should work for everyone else. Take yeah. one idea, and I'll use this as a principle. And again, I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm throwing it out as food for thought. One of the thoughts that's often put forward is hand first, then body follows. Right. So, we, we, so it's like, ba boom, ba boom. Yeah. So you say the straight leap. Now, of course, that comes from fencing. Right. Um, and that itself comes from, if you look at uh, like HEMA or the European treatises, and it's called real time. And the reason it's called real time is the weapon leaves, the body goes behind it. And some of the guys I train with are actually sword fighters and sword champions. They actually fight in the medieval tournaments. So I've done some training with those guys, and that's how I know that's what they call it real time. But if you look at the physics behind it, if you look at, uh, say, baseball, do you move the bat first and then shove the body behind it? No. Why not? Uh, you might not be able to hit it. As, I, I don't know much baseball. I know cricket. Um, Let's do cricket. Well, same thing as well, you know? <laughs> right? But, yeah. So if I, if I step into it, my chances of hitting a six are greatly improved. Yes. So set, let's say two shots. Forward defensive shot and pull shot. Mm -hmm. Let's really confuse the Americans who don't know what... <laughs> yeah. So I <laughs> four defensive shot. First thing you do is you move forward, bam, then you hit it down with the bat. Pull shot, you retreat to the rear foot, then the bat goes. Yeah. Both instances, the body goes, the bat follows. Yes. You set yourself, you're primed, you make the contact, you hit the sweet shot, you either do the defensive shot or you pull the six. Baseball, same thing. Comes in, you move, you swing, bang. The last thing that makes contact is the bat. When you're doing a pitch, you don't throw the ball and then shove your body behind it. The body goes in this whole big motion, and the last thing that moves is the ball. So if we're looking at maximal power generation, does it make sense to move the hand first? Not always. So this is, again, not everything is black and white. Right. So yeah. hand first could be a guideline, but a guideline is not a rule. Mm-hmm. So I before E except after C is a guideline, but it's one of the only guidelines where there are more exceptions than there are actual corroborations. So this is, again, what I mean by just applying a thought process to what we're doing. So when I yeah. take, as our boxers, for example, tend to move, the body goes, bang, then the hand goes. Yes. They don't move the hand, then the body behind it. So what makes JKD so special that we move the hand first? Now, again, I'm not saying I have the answer. I've got my own thought process on that. But yeah. ask the questions. Right. Seek the cause of your own ignorance, as Bruce would say. So we exactly. question e we question everything. I question everything. Yeah, and that way you find you know if it can't if it can't absorb the if it can't stand up to the questioning, it doesn't deserve to stand. Yeah, have you ever tried explaining cricket to a group of people? No, it's, it's seriously it's one of the most peculiarly weird sports. It, it's it makes no sense. Although the Ashes were actually on in the UK when I left, so uh -huh. it was that was that was quite a high point over there. But no, cricket as a game to explain is one of the weirdest concepts. It's yeah, no, I I gave up. Yeah, okay. Well, I I do it every once in a while. It's fun. It's great fun. Americans just cannot get it. You know, but, but if I, but I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you this. I'll just tell you, if I go on the YouTube and I look at clips of cricket, mm -hmm. I'm on there for two hours. It's amazing. When it's good cricket, it's, yeah. it, you stay with it. My father was a massive cricketer. He actually, I mean, he passed away a couple of years ago, bless his heart. But he was, um, he very much formed the youth program at Hyde Cricket Club. Um, mm -hmm. And he gave me, I'm not as much in love with the game as my brother is. My brother was always more into it. Um, but I was a reasonable medium pace bowler 
uh, and a bloody terrible bat. I had two shots, a four defensive and a big sharp slap across the line. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Anything other than that. And... Yeah. Yeah. Um, so did you, did you learn about organization of programs from your dad? Uh, no. No. No? Um, no. So what, prepa what prepared you for running a school and, and a, you know, developing a curriculum and stuff like that? Um, I started teaching martial arts when I was in the UK. So when I got my black belt, I was um, already teaching at a club and it was called uh, uh, Freestyle Combat. And it was based in, in Hull. Uh, this was just as the UFCs were coming out. Okay. So I had a friend of mine, Mel Leithley, um, who uh, he was training under me, but we both had an interest in the UFCs. And in the UK, you couldn't find them at all. You had to get these very grainy, very illegal imported VHSs. Um, <laughs> I, I, I make no bones about that because we'd read about them in the magazines because we used to get like all the martial arts masters magazines and all those because there was right. a, 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 a wealth of magazines available in like the, uh, the 90s that just don't exist anymore. Yes. Like the old Inside Karate, Inside Kung Fu, Masters mm -hmm. Mag and then they had specials that used to go every other month and things. Yeah. Um, so we used to read about these events, but never actually see them. So we started importing these very grainy VHS um, underground tapes. And by importing these, we also got access to like the Gracie in Action tapes. Then we yeah. got the, the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Basic tapes and things. So my friend and I, Mel, we... Um, we started training them. We'd watch the tapes and then we'd go and kick the piss out of each other just to see if it worked. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we kind of developed it from there. And all we would do is our teaching was our way of seeing if we understood the material. So the process was we'd view it, drill it so we got it, then teach it. And if it stuck, we knew that was good. And if it didn't, right. we'd get rid of it. Oh, we'd have revisit and try it again. So it was, okay. much, it was throwing mud at the wall and seeing what stuck. It was a very loose club. It was more just a group of guys that got together. Right. Um, and I certainly didn't make any money doing it. Um, but it was fun. And it was a raw time. And it was a time of experimentation and play. And, you know, we, we had a lot of fun doing it. Um, what then happened is over the years, I mean, as you may have gathered by now, I do like the sound of my own voice. Um, and as I'm a graduate in English language and literature, public presentation speaking was, was natural to me. I've just always right. been nat naturally loquacious and just like to throw it out there. So mm -hmm. my lessons were never formally put down. Even to this day, I never plan lessons. I wow. kind of, I, I don't, I've never, I've been teaching, I've been training for over 30 years. I've been teaching for over 20. I, I still to this day don't plan lessons. Private um, students also? Uh, uh, private students ask me what they want. Okay. So when they book a private lesson with me, they'll say, can we work on this? Okay. If I say, is there anything you want to work on? They'll say, no, just, I just want to do a private with you. I'm like, okay, fine. And yeah. normally a lot of it will depend on what mood I'm in, what energy I sense from the class and the makeup of the class. So if I go in and it's four or five guys and they're all the, the, you know, the spit and sawdust guys, yeah. it's like, right. Okay. Shields in glove up. We're going to have some fun tonight. If I got a okay. mix of beginners in advance, then we go have, we go heavier on the drills and the, the concept pieces. Right. Um, so if I plan, I mean, I've, I've fallen foul of it. The only few times I've ever planned a lesson, I've gone in with a lesson. It's gone off the rails in the first two passes. And, it's, <laughs> and, and I end up riffing anyway. So, right. and this is a funny thing as well. This will make you laugh and you may or may not believe this, but ask Singh and he'll tell you. Every time I teach, uh, whether that's a class or whether that's a seminar, Mm -hmm. I have a theme. I never had a plan. So a seminar, if you say, Jay, can you do a seminar on catch wrestling, which is another one of my big loves that I teach. Mm -hmm. I'll say, okay. And I'll just turn up and I riff. I never plan it. I never know what I'm going to do until I'm on the mat and I start and I just see where the mood takes me. Right. So I never, I never plan anything because to my mind, if you know it, you know it. If you don't, you don't. And no amount of rehearsal is going to help me know my material any better. If okay. I don't know, if I don't know it that viscerally and that internally, I shouldn't be teaching it. Do you riff in any other areas of your life? Um, I riff a lot. Yeah. Does it drive anybody crazy? My wife goes out of her cake. <laughs> <laughs> and how long have you been married? 19 years in September the 16th this year. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I shall keep my fingers crossed for you, my friend. Well, the funny thing is, <laughs> it's that running joke. It's like men marry women thinking they'll never change and they do. And women marry men thinking they'll change them and they won't. 
<laughs> okay. All right. So listen, I got the 20% uh, power um, remaining thing just now. So we got to start uh, wrapping this up. So I, I okay. got to ask you this. Um, Canadian directorship of Jeet Kune Do Athletic Association. Yeah. Correct? Okay. Yes. That came about, be, that came about uh, because of? Um, because Singh deemed me worthy of the honor. Oh, okay. There we go. So um, All right. <laughs> what happened uh, within, I mean, I've got two roles, effectively. I, I've got the mm -hmm. Canadian director is my big one, but I'm also one of the law enforcement training advisors. Um, oh, okay. the, pr the primary role behind that, I mean, is um, a, a brother of mine, Dee Burton, who's an absolute machine. Um, just look like a little spark plug of a fighter. So he's the other guy that does it too. Um, but Canadian director is the one I go. Now, what Singh has is he has his students, he has his instructors, and then he has his uh, advisors and representatives. So it's like his little mini council, for want of a better word. So I represent, I'm the Canadian territory representative, basically. So if there's an issue in Canada or something that needs doing in Canada, I'd be the one he'd default to in theory. In okay. principle, Singh being as hands-on as he is, he normally handles it himself and just tells me. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> fine. Yeah, I took care this, of this, it. This, yeah. this is an easy job. Yeah, you know, I can do All it. Right. But there's only, okay. been a couple of time, there's only been a couple of times I've had to use my role independent of Singh and make decisions. I've expelled a couple of people, um, but nothing really uh, drastic on that side of things. Okay. And membership in uh, Angels Disciples. Mm. Now... That was with uh, Grandmaster T-Bone. So I'm not formally graded with Grandmaster T-Bone. Okay. But I first met him at the, uh, the, the Jeet Kune Do Athletic Association Expo, the very first one we did, which was uh, mm -hmm. six years ago now, I think. Okay. So I'd already done uh, 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 a screener before. I'd done some Ducky Perez. And as I'm sure yourself has, I'd done some ILS too. So that was where I'd done most of my bones. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so... I had an understanding of, of, of the systems and things. Went to California that year, and it was a, it was a great chance because then uh, we had Carlito Bonnick was there as well. He did his um, uh, teaching of Serrata, as taught to him by uh, uh, Greg Grandmaster and Jacobalis, which was great. He did a really nice presentation. Um, then Darren came with his son, Chez, and Gelmar Cabalis, who's uh, Angel's youngest son. Okay. They went on the, the, the floor. And have you ever seen um, the demo from the Angels Disciples? Have you ever seen those guys move? Yes. I watched them and my jaw went clunk. <laughs> and you know, it's a little bit like when you fall in love with a girl. Okay. What you see in that girl isn't necessarily going to be what everybody else sees in that girl. But you fall in love with that girl. Right. So, so I saw Serata move and I knew, I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. Okay. This this is the this is an art I want to do right. and I want to do this right now. So I, I just fell in love with it right out the gate. And I think it helped because I was really trying to do it properly and you know, this big lanky, clumsy brick arsehole here. And I'm ballsing it up and Darren must have taken a shine to it. He came up and said, Now Brad, now Brad, now so he starts fixing me there and then. <laughs> so on the first time I was there, I got personal instruction from Darren T Bone. So I'm like, oh, All right. it doesn't get much better than this. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and from there on, I just took to Serrata and to the point where um, I don't do much other Filipino art other than Serrata um, okay. anymore. What I teach is Serrata, what I practice is Serrata, what I teach my students is Serrata. Um, okay. it, I, just, I just love it. I just find it one of the most dynamic, efficient of the arts, um, period. Yeah. No, not just Filipino arts, but just in and of yeah. itself, just period. When I, when I first saw uh, Dan Inasano and Cass Magda move, I was like, that's it. That's what I want to do. It I is. You, yeah. it, it's that feel you get for it. Now, um, uh, the, I think Angel was Dan's first Filipino instructor as well. Uh, he was one of the early ones, yes. For yeah, sure. I think he was, he was first out of the yeah. gate. So it was kind of, yeah. and Dar Darren and, um, and Dan are actually related on the family tree. Oh, okay. Hey, so hey you know, you know do, do you know Cass Magda? He's one of the coolest Canadians there is out there. I actually don't know Cass. He's another one of those guys I know of, Cass. I don't know okay. him. But even for back in the day, Cass was one of those names we used to hear in the UK a lot. He actually had a big name over there. Yes. Um, so I knew of Cass through Martial Arts Illustrated magazine because he was right. like one mm -hmm. of the big JKD names. So, yep. yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, all right. So now, uh, two more things. Your brother's basement is a boxing gym. Uh, no, his garage, his shed is. So he's got okay. a big... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you saw the video? Yes. Um, <laughs> he, he's got a, a, basically a, a garage-sized shed at the back, which he's converted to a boxing gym. Who's the bigger nut, you or your brother? 
Uh, in terms of what? Because it's a very, <laughs> very loaded question. <laughs> I'm more outgoing than he is, put it that way. Okay, okay. All right, we'll, 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 do, we'll go with that. All right, and <laughs> I love that video, by the way. Oh, uh, thank it, you. It, it, yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it's really good. Um, where were you? Because you said you're 45, so my math yep. says then you were born in 74. And I had a question for you um, about where you were on July 20th, 1973, when Bruce Lee passed away. But you weren't born yet, huh? I, I don't even think I was working my way through the fallopian tubes then. Ah. Um, so. <laughs> Interesting. No, so, see... Uh, you see, I find that fascinating, right? That now I get to probe the minds of people who weren't even born when Bruce Lee passed away. Yeah. Um, in many ways, we, we inherited the legend. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, more people know about Bruce Lee now than when he was alive. Certainly, yeah. outside, of, certainly outside the U.S. Because mm -hmm. in the U.K., wouldn't have been that big a name. Um, and I don't know if you watch my podcast with Professor Hunden, but he said he still meets guys to this day that don't know who Bruce is, which I found infallible, but it's, it's true. Right. Yeah. So um, Bruce Lee was this, um, this deity within the martial arts world that as he died, he was a, such a loss to the community. His legend kind of spiraled from there. Yeah. So as I was hitting the age when I'm aware of that sort of thing, um, I not only inherited the legend of Bruce Lee, but I inherited the fallout of all the people that wanted to be the next Bruce Lee. So there was that second wave that came in and the computer games that go along with that, because that was, believe it or not, my very first exposure to martial arts. It was a computer in the UK. Did you have Commodore 64s was the big one in the States? Uh, I, I probably wasn't in the States when the Commodore oh, 64 thing go. came about. Yeah. Well, the Commodore 64, <laughs> we did have that in the UK, but we also had one called the ZX Spectrum. And that was the one I had. And it was a computer game on it called Way of the Exploding Fist. And no, that was my, I, there's no I, way you'd know it. It's a little no. like it's, it's a little like international karate. If you remember playing, uh, no, I have no, no idea what you're talking about. No, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully the listeners do, and that's not a wasted <laughs> analogy. So, my, my very first exposure was actually was actually a computer game, and then obviously you see the magazines, you see the pictures, you see all this other stuff as well. So okay. Bruce, Bruce Lee became a much bigger media figure posthumously than he ever was when he was alive. Yeah, I, I'm still fielding questions on Quora about, about him and about the whole um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood fiasco. Ah. Yeah. yeah. Now, what I find most interesting about that is a lot of people are getting upset with the depiction of an individual. But if you actually break that down, A, again, what I said earlier on, he was a great man, but he was just a man. So no one yeah. becomes untouchable within that. He had every single flaw in his personality that a man would have had. So let's get that out of the way. Yeah. Most of the people upset with it seem to be upset with other people being upset because they haven't actually seen the film. <laughs> so, so, do you know the context behind this? Because it was a daydream scene in a film, which right. is an imaginary reimagining of the Manson murders that didn't then happen because they were fighting them at the end. So it's like, this is the yeah. thing you got an issue with? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it so is. For, for me, it was, it was like I failed to see the outrage because if you were a stuntman or someone in a daydream that you were going to make yourself look bigger, better, and badder, of course you're going to tell the story that you beat Bruce Lee in a fight. So it's actually right. a sideways compliment if you look at it because beating a nobody means nothing. I beat Bruce Lee means something because Bruce Lee right. is something. So within yeah, the context it, the, of the film, it's, a back, it, it's kind of a sideways compliment, but it's a yeah. compliment nonetheless. It's, it's one of those Jeet Kune Do subtleties that a lot of people don't get. I agree with you 100%. I really do. Yeah. And I, so I fail to see the outrage. But yeah. Just me. All right. So listen, my friend, I'm going to run out of power in a second. So I want to okay. thank you for taking some time out. Uh, so what are you going to do now? No, absolute Go pleasure. Thank you. Family. Oh, man. But yeah. There you go. I missed that because you you sounded like you had your head in a bucket and just taken a lot of Mogadon. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, I was going to ask you, what are you going to go do now? Well, I am going to go and quickly get a bite to eat, and then I'm actually teaching class tonight. So I've got, I've got JKD at oh. 7, and then I'm teaching Jiu Jitsu okay. at 8. So I've got two classes tonight. All right, man. Okay, well, look, have a great time, and thanks again for doing this. I appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Dwight.
All right, man. Okay, and PM me that that stuff, right? I will do. Again, so I'll do. I'll do a direct message with you, and we'll sort that out. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. Thanks Take so much, man. All right. No worries, man. Take care. Bye. All right. Cool. So that was uh, episode number eighty-seven of the. Uh, Jeet Kune Do Dialogues with uh, Dur Hunder. So you guys can look him up on uh, on Facebook. And um, you, you know the deal, right? Feel free to like, share, comment, all that stuff. Ask questions. Um, uh, we, he and I will go through it and um, answer what we need to. Um, I think I, I told you at the beginning about um, Wednesday. So we'll have the broadcast at 3 p.m. And then uh, episode number two of the F FMA files at 6 p.m. with uh, Guru Guy Chase. And um, what else is there that I should tell you? Uh, on Friday, the episode of the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues will be with uh, Russell Leak out of... Um, out, oh, gosh. Why didn't I look it up? I think he's out of North Carolina, but I'm not sure. He might be out of Connecticut. I'll have everything straightened out by Friday. All right, so um, sign up for notifications for when we go live here on Facebook. And please subscribe to the YouTube channels for the I Love Jeet Kune Do uh, broadcast, the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues, and the aforementioned FMA files, which is up and running. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Dwight Woods, on Instagram at Dwight D. Woods. Um, at ilovejikando.com, the Quick Skills Series Volume 1 is still available. You can get that there. And I think I told you about everything that's coming up. So I'll see you um, next time that I see you. You guys have a great week. This is Dwight Woods, the Jikando Rebel, signing out. Take care of yourselves. See you soon. And we're live. Hello, everyone. This is Dwight Woods, the Jeet Kune Do Rebel, and welcome to episode number 87 of the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues. Where we'll find out from Der Hunder uh, which name he, he prefers for people to use. Okay. How you, How doing? you go, buddy? How you go, brother? I'm good, man. You look good. You look clean. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not something that gets thrown at me very often. <laughs> so, how, so, okay, wait. So, Jamie is saying he loves the shirt. Is it my shirt or? So, how should we refer to you, Jay Cooper, Der Hunter, what? Uh, Jay, Jay Cooper is my main name. Um, Okay. Well, two seconds. I'm getting. I'm getting some feedback. Give me a second. Give me a second. Okay. Yeah. One he's, sec. qu he's quite the tech guy, guys. Uh oh, too much of a tech guy. Oh, okay. All right, Jamie. <laughs> this is a custom-made thing from uh, my my old student uh, Kevin Porter. You will you will not see this anywhere, other than here. All right, um, unless Mr. Mr. Um, Porter gets back into making JKD t-shirts and then who knows what will happen. All right, so I might have to, um, hey Pedro, I might have to send another invitation out to Mr. Cooper. So guys, hang on a second. Okay, all right, so uh, let's see if I can uh, nope. Okay, hang tough, guys. I might have to um, do this all again. Do, do, do. Da, da, da. I don't think there's a way to, once I've started and sent the invitation that there's a way to send it again. So I'm going to have to shut this down and, and restart, guys. Sorry about that.